Cool. Thanks, Simon. All right, so this presentation might be a little bit different to some of the others. The point is to give you uh, some tips, tricks, and tools to help solve your own problems um, that you might come across in your day-to-day -day job, projects you're involved in. Can I just get a bit of a show of hands if you've been in a project or had someone send you some crazy spreadsheet or a system or a workflow? Yeah, I didn't quite get time to make a bingo card, but... <laughs> Oh, you can mentally uh, check the boxes as you come across these smells. So first, you're probably wondering what on earth I'm on about smells. Um, this is a term that I shamelessly stole from the world of software development, where there's these things called code smells. And those are readily identified surface indications, like things you can spot easily that kind of show you something's wrong. Um, it's not necessarily a bug but it kind of can indicate that there's deeper problems in a system, something could be fragile. And with a bit of practice, you can kind of identify smells quite easily in code, but fixing them, you know, especially if it's a deeper systemic problem, can take a lot of knowledge and experience. And as we'll see with these spreadsheet smells, like there's often not always an easy win. You're gonna have to uh, hunt around a little bit and figure out what you're actually trying to do. And the reason I'm picking on spreadsheets and, you know, it's not actually just Microsoft, really. Um, you can make them a variety of different ways, but they are everywhere. And it's so easy to get started with spreadsheets um, and make something reasonably powerful. You can do quite a lot pretty easily. And you can kind of share them with other people, um, get your calculations or data out there. Sort of, as we'll see, there's usually problems with that. But spreadsheets, I'm sure there are a lot of downsides. So the GIF, uh, sorry, the, the meme. <laughs> Excel loves turning everything into dates. And I mean, it got so bad in uh, genetic science that they have had to rename a gene just to stop it always getting converted into a date. But spreadsheets can also kill. Uh, in the UK, about 16,000 people's COVID records got lost because they were exporting to an old Excel format that had a 16,000 row limitation and so people didn't get the health care that they needed to. So as I mentioned, it's really easy to get started with spreadsheets. You know, when you first start out, you can do quite a lot. It's quite simple, um, and you're in the green there. But as what you're trying to do gets more and more complex, you kind of reach a bit of a peak, what I call the point of efficiency. And as it goes bigger, you're trying to share it with more people or do, do more to it. You really just kind of go off the cliff and it's really hard to find that point where you need to stop. And so that's the point of this presentation, try and help you identify, hey, when do I need to stop and what could I possibly do about it? And like I said before, there's not always easy answers. You're really gonna have to think about what you're trying to do, how you're trying to do it, and uh, consider all options, weigh them up. So the first smell I've called confounding concerns. Because spreadsheets just let you do so much, you've got data, you've got mathematical functions, you've got charting, there's so many tools in the box, and then people use them to do so many things, like calculation tools or business processes that they're trying to enforce through a spreadsheet. Basically, that flexibility gives you a lot of power, but you can end up in a point where it's basically impossible to update or unpick problems you run into. Um, and there are crazy issues you can come across. We had one recently where uh, a research organization had built a tool that they were gonna give to government people to use, but they'd implemented this tool in macros. And government agencies don't really let you run macros in spreadsheets um, easily. So you can run to all kinds of stuff. So what can you do about that? Well, it really depends on your use case. So if the main thing you're trying to do is display outputs, you probably want an analytics platform, something like Power BI or Tableau, which have rich visualization tools. They can do charts and tables and smart filtering, and they can pull data from various sources, which could even be a spreadsheet published somewhere. Um, and they can do basic calculations, and they really have good tools about sharing. If what you're trying to do is more on the calculation and analysis side, you probably want to look into programming languages. And you can use spreadsheets if you have to as a 
maybe the data store on the input and data store on the output and actually um, get the logic of your calculation into something more robust. And things like R and Python, they can connect to a wide variety of data sources. They include, or you have options for libraries, heaps of different powerful statistical and numerical functions. And you can leverage a lot of libraries to do like visual, compelling visual outputs and things like that. If what you're primarily doing is trying to move data between systems, don't do what Public Health England did and lose lots of records, use something proper like FME or um, I'm sure there are other ETL tools, but they are really optimized for pulling data from one system, doing a little bit of stuff to it and putting it into another system. And if you're going for a business process or calculation tool, it's probably something like a web application um, is going to be a better fit for what you're trying to do. Um, and these actually also let you separate concerns. What's happening where? And I'll get into that a bit more in a minute. But you can really enforce process steps and validations on the kind of things people can put into it um, a lot more rigorously than you can in a spreadsheet. And one of the potential solutions is actually a spreadsheet. Surprise but a carefully designed spreadsheet. So what you need to do is really carefully unpick what's the data that's coming into my process, what's the calculation, and what's the output. So you can use multiple tabs to do this, very careful column naming and things like that. Um, and that sort of separation concerns is something we do quite a lot in coding, um, software development, but people, yeah, it's so easy to jumble things in a spreadsheet that it doesn't happen that much. Um, Cool, and our next smell is prodigious proportions. So Excel will let you make a sheet with a million rows, 16,000 columns, and as many sheets as your computer's memory can handle, but at some point, you're just gonna start hitting limits. It's gonna be really hard to open. It's gonna keep corrupting the data and stuff like that. Um, oh yeah, and if you're trying to share it, it just becomes a nightmare. So the main things to do to get around that, um, you've got a few different options, but it's essentially, instead of using Excel, just use a database. Um, there's a few different kinds, if you're not familiar with them, um, single user databases, uh, and the most popular one everyone's probably familiar with is SQLite, which just lives in a file on your file system, um, and it's great if you just wanna be able to one person read and write from it and do some simple calculations in SQL, Microsoft Access is another option. Um, or if you need a situation that multiple people are reading and writing from the database, you probably want an actual relational database management system. So this sits on a server somewhere and multiple people can log in and you, know, you can have logic for handling people doing things at the same time. And if you had all that data, but the real thing you're trying to do is present it, once again, Power BI or potentially even a web application would be a better way to get around that. Up next, you've probably all come across situations like this where someone had the file open or someone emailed another version instead of doing it on the shared drive and suddenly you've got hundreds of different versions and I mean, you can't even tell which one was the one that was supposed to be opened last or the final or what was actually sent to the client. <sighs> yeah, I've had nightmares about this, I'm sure. So to get around this, you can try to enforce strict naming conventions. I put a little squiggle there because it pretty much never works out. Um, cloud document management tools also kind of, in theory, let you do some sort of version control, but I've never seen it really work that well and you kind of just end up in that crazy naming situation again. I Ideally, you'd be able to split out your inputs. Calculations could be in code, and then you can use version control. So I've just included a little diagram down there that sort of shows what version control is like. You can have your work separate from other people's work, and you can kind of track um, how, how things are changing over time in terms of the calculations um, that are going on there. Next smell is fiendish formulae. It's, uh, yeah, Excel formulas are the worst. I mean, you can look at this for five minutes and still really not know what on earth's going on. When it's referencing other sheets, cells all over the place, and especially when you've got logic um, and deeply nested logic, because if, and, and or statements, they just go crazy. Uh, so to get around that, once again, 
You really want to try to break stuff up into smaller and clear steps. So if, even if you're keeping with the spreadsheet, try to really get good labeled columns, sheets which break down what's input, what's calculations, what's output. Um, but be careful that you don't end up with too many columns or sheets. You'll start hitting some of the other smells that I mentioned before. But the ideal solution that I keep coming back to, you can tell I'm a programmer, right? Um, is that you do it in a programming language. And I've included a little picture there that just shows testing. That's something amazing you can get when you're doing stuff in like Python. You can write unit tests for your code. And actually, it's amazing. It gives you so much certainty and safety that your code's actually doing what you think it's supposed to be doing, which is really hard to do with uh, stuff that's all crazy in Excel. And it's probably just worth talking about now um, that recently Python in Excel has been announced. And that sounds, on the face of it, pretty cool. Unfortunately, uh, it's a paid subscription thingy and all the code that you write and the data you're running gets sent to the cloud to be run. So I think it's probably not what you're looking for in most cases. It might, you know, it may help. I don't know, it's probably not a silver bullet is what I'm saying. I mean, and if you're looking at Python, being able to read and write Excel files, this is just a list of libraries that will do that quite competently for you. And the final one should be close to everyone's heart here, mapping, you can, ah, <laughs> maps and spreadsheets. Yes, you can do it. Um, I mean, this smell sometimes comes up where people are recording information that is location information, but in a non-spatial way, like text descriptions of where stuff is, you know, three-eighths of a furthing past the big tree, and which we've had stuff like that uh, for some speed limit data I've seen before. Um, if you're trying to do analysis on locations in a spreadsheet, I'm sure you guys mostly know, but mm, engineers and things like that don't always, um, when it comes to projection systems and stuff like that, you can really make a big mess. And if you're transferring data around, um, once again, the Public Health of England losing the COVID records, but you can also end up with a loss of precision um, and things can get cast all kinds of ways you didn't really want them to be. So the solutions, once again, you've got to just come back and carefully try and think about what you're trying to do. Um, if it was that first case where you've got non-spatial information or non-sort of spatial representation of location information, really think about that. You can collect coordinates even if you don't necessarily show them to the user or do analysis with them. It can be handy to have for later. You're not sure what might come along. If you're trying to do spatial analysis, make sure you use spatial tools like QGIS. And these just help manage the complexity of trying to deal with coordinate systems and things like that. And if you're transforming between tools, you know, uh, use appropriate formats or ETL tools. Cool, and that's the five smells. So I'm just gonna go through a few tips. When you're on a project or someone sends you a spreadsheet or you're doing something that starts just getting a bit crazy, just take a breath and uh, be aware of when your spreadsheet's kind of going beyond that point of efficiency. Hopefully after a while you start to get a bit of a sense um, before it gets too bad. And unfortunately none of the alternatives I've talked about is free. They all require work or costs or something like that. But, you know, in the same token, if you're continuing way far down the past the point of efficiency with the spreadsheet, that's also costing you and grey hair and maybe you'll murder someone. And um, so make sure, once you find yourself in that point, you really have to understand what's actually required of the thing that you're trying to do, the system you're trying to work with. So does it need to be shared with other people? That's probably one of the biggest things, and you know where you get quite a few of those smells are coming up where multiple people are trying to edit it, you've got it on a shared drive. Um, the security of that sharing, who can access it, who can edit it or only view it. Um, you may have to protect IP if you're uh, in certain spaces and you only want to have data that can be uh, seen or added into a system. Um, then how that data actually gets in and out, what formats it in, how's it going to go around. Um, and think about the calculations that actually need to happen there. And finally, once you've kind of understood what it is that you're trying to do, you can proactively design it, build on the requirements. And I'm always a big fan of experimenting and prototyping, you know, jump in and, and have a crack at Python and see what you can do or 
anything like that. Cool, and that's me. Hopefully that has been useful. Okay, we've got a, an opportunity to ask Stacey some questions. Um, so the microphone's going around, just raise your hand um, and the microphone will come to you. What is the character limit for the entering a formula into Excel? <laughs> I don't even know if there is one, is there? There is one. Wow. A friend came to me and told me he found that and I was truly horrified by that <laughs> particular He was bleeding from his smell. eyes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Thanks for the talk. Um, you mentioned version control uh, as a potential solution. Uh, is, in, to your knowledge, is there an actual way to do proper version control with spreadsheets outside of just sticking the binary in a Git repository? Uh, is it possible? Yeah, um, not that I'm aware of. Like I say, the, the cloud document management tools kind of give you a revisions-y thing, but it's, yeah, I'm sure you've seen it. Um, one interesting thing, though, is CART. So you might have seen some of the coordinates guys have talked about it. And that potentially um, could be extended to work across something like a spreadsheet, because they have these sort of adapters that um, select how the file works in the working directory. So they're kind of using geo packages at the moment, but there's probably in theory no reason that that couldn't actually be a spreadsheet as long as they can, you know, get data into it, figure out changes and get data back out of it. So yeah, it's possible. <laughs>